Essential thoughts, thoughts of ill will, and, and thoughts of harmony. An earnest, capable person abandons, dispels, terminates, and obliterates them. So these are, this is a standard kind of uh, defilements you see in the suttas, the three types of bad thoughts. Essential uh, thoughts is any thought that has to do with sensual craving and so craving in the area of the five senses um, and uh, that as I mentioned before I don't think that's the most important one the most important one is the second one the thoughts of ill will and perhaps the third one the thoughts of mind and yeah. thoughts of ill will I think we know pretty much what that is right anger uh, negativity upset you know hatred all this kind of stuff thoughts of ill will and, but the last one is quite interesting. The last one is the thoughts of harming. And the uh, uh, term for harming in the suttas is either hingsa or vihingsa. And it's one of those very important terms that you find in Indian philosophy. Uh, for example, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, the, um, uh, the famous uh, Indian who led the uprising against the British uh, rule in India, uh, he, he led the uh, ahingsa movement, right? Ahingsa which was against uh, uh, protesting in a peaceful way against the British rule of India. And so this is the same kind of term we are seeing here now. So what does it actually mean, uh, uh, thoughts of harming? What, is it, what does it actually mean? And I th the meaning, it seems to me, is that harming is here the opposite of compassion. Now in English language, the opposite of compassion is really being ruthless or uncaring. Yeah? You don't care about the consequences that things have for the people around you. So you are ruthless, right? Like a ruthless business person is a person who, for whom profit and business success is much more important than how it affects people around you. So if you don't care about how it affects people around you, you just kind of, you know, people, people are kind of expendable, right? People don't matter. What matters is the success of the business. And you are ruthless in that sense. You don't actually have ill will against the people. You don't really want necessarily want to harm them, but you don't care about the consequences of what you are doing. So this is uh, what this is about. Uh, in, uh, in English, they have a word, an ancient word, it goes back to the 17th century, which is ruthful. And ruthful is the same as Passionate. You have ruthless on the one hand, and you have ruthful on the other hand. But uh, you don't, it's not the word that you hear anymore. Yeah? It, it, that hasn't been used since the 1750s 17, or something like that. Yeah? So, Ruth in the English means compassion. I don't know, you've probably heard the, the name Ruth, right? Some people are called Ruth. That actually means compassionate one. Compassionate is nice, yeah, compassion. Like Karuna. So these are the kind of thoughts, so you know, you shouldn't, the idea here is that instead of being cold toward people, toward being callous, uh, being uncaring, uh, you have a sense of warmth, an understanding of the pain that other, other beings go through, and, and for that you care, and you, you, you help them, and you have compassion rather than being cold hearted. Uh, this is a large part of what this is about. Too. So these are the middling defilements. Uh, and we will talk a lot more later on about how to overcome ill will. 
It's a very important part of the practice, so we'll zoom down on that coming up later on. And I will also talk more about sensuality as well, because sensuality is basically the whole realm of sensual thoughts, all the attachments we have to our belongings, for example, whatever belongings you have, your house or whatever, all of that belongs to the realm of sensual thought. So it's a very broad category. All the, pretty much all the things that we attach to in life is included in that. So if you are an earnest and capable, you abandon that, you dispel it, you terminate it and obliterate it using wisdom power, right? Not willpower. And this was one of the last things I was trying to say before we had to break for lunch, is this idea that wisdom power is far more powerful than willpower. Because once you see something clearly, it just disappears, just like that. Like clear seeing that this anger is dangerous, but it can lead me in the wrong way, and the anger just goes like that. This is the power of wisdom. So really the only way to obliterate something is to use wisdom. You cannot obliterate things by using willpower. All you can do is really suppress it and oppress it for a while. Okay, then we come to the uh, subtle defilements. Uh, when this has been done, there remain in that person subtle defilements, thoughts about their relations, thoughts about their country, thoughts about their reputation. An earnest, capable person abandons, dispels them, terminates and obliterates them. So, at this point, only very refined defilements are remaining. All the main aspects of the defilements have already been removed, right? We have dealt with sensual thoughts and thoughts of ill will. And so these are really the kind of main defilements in the mind. There. And what remains now is are some very subtle things that are, 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 are left. And these, are, these things are still you know, concerned with attachments in a certain way, but not with them. Um, uh, but but it's, kind of, it's getting very refined as uh, uh, we get to this stage. Now, if you look at these things, thoughts about your relations, thoughts about your country, and thoughts about your reputation, well, it has a lot to do with our sense of identity, right? Who we think we are. You know, we, we belong to a certain family, and we have a certain position in the family. You know, you're a daughter or a son, you're a mother or a father, you're a grandparent, you're a wife or a husband, a sister or a brother. All of these things have a certain identity. And not only identity in that sense, but we identify with the kind of family we have, right? What kind of family do you come from? Is it, are you wealthy or poor? Are you, uh, you know, is it high status or low status? And, and all of these things are things that are very, very close to us and we identify with very strongly. So this is, for that reason, there are quite strong attachments in this area. So, and that's, of course, why it's difficult sometimes to give up what's one's family completely because of those attachments. Thoughts about one's country, right? Uh, you identify with your country, you identify you belong to a certain group of people, and a certain whatever it is, uh, and we identify with like, right, I'm from Malaysia, or, or I, you know, I belong to the Chinese culture, or I belong to Malay culture, or I'm from Norway, or you know, whatever it is. Uh, all of these things are identities, they're part of our sense of self, uh, of who we are and who we belong to. Uh, Norway, we, everybody goes skiing, so I kind of we have we're attached to the idea of skiing, right? And they say in Norway that you are born with skis on your feet, because everybody <laughs> skis. And imagine the suffering of being a mother, right, if you're born with skis on your feet. <laughs> so that's one of the disadvantages of being a Norwegian. Uh. <laughs> so all of these things are things we identify with, we are, this is our sense of self. This is why this gets very complicated now, because it comes to our sense of self. Right? This is sometimes the idea of anta and anatta in Buddhism are very, is a very subtle and refined doctrine. Yeah? But this is where we can understand it, yeah? because this is where kind of, we hold on to these ideas. And this is how it comes out in its normal ways, how we can feel uh, the sense of self inside of us. So all of these things we attach to reputation, right? Very important thing. Yeah? Do they like me? Do they not like me? Do I have a bad reputation and good reputation? And these are kind of things that we are always worried about. And if somebody blames us for the wrong reason, we get upset. And if they praise us for the wrong reason, well, then it's not so, then it's okay, then it's not so bad. But if they blame us, then it's bad news. So all of these things have to do with a sense of self. So why does this matter? Why is it important? And 
Uh, one reason why it matters is that uh, the sense of self inside of us always needs to be defended, right? Uh, if you look at your thinking patterns, almost everybody's way of thinking is it's often about ourselves a lot. Uh, you know, if you have been in an argument, you think about, oh, and you defend yourself in your head, right? Uh, because you've been in your argument uh, and you, you kind of put out your case and the other person is wrong and I'm right, this kind of stuff. Uh, a lot of our thinking is, is about ourselves, about defending who we are, our honor, our dignity, our sense of being right or whatever it is. So because of that, the sense of self it can be an obstacle in meditation practice uh, because it, it, it tends to feed the thinking mind, uh, right? Uh, about past, about future, all these kind of things. Uh, so by reducing your sense of self, uh, reducing who you are, you actually think less. Uh, right? You don't worry so much about things. Uh, this, is, this is part and parcel of what this happens. The less attachments we have, uh, attachment to country or family, well, you're going to think about that family if you're attached to it. Uh, that's just the way it is. Uh, to think about, I'm Norwegian, I'm living in Australia, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, you, you think about these things, uh, and this, this is what makes, uh, makes it so hard. So by reducing your attachments uh, and reducing that, you're reducing your sense of self, uh, you actually get more peaceful as a consequence. You let attachments go, when attachments go, you can move inside, you can move to samadhi, rather than be pre preoccupied with the external world of all these things that don't really matter. And it's very beautiful, right? When you start to reduce your attachment to nationality or to even to gender or to a particular position in the family, you can actually embrace other people so much more easily. Yeah? We're all the same. We're all in the same boat. We all have the same problems. We all have the same aspirations. Nobody wants to suffer. Everybody wants to be happy. And the human heart is basically the same. There's no need to divide ourselves so much into all these different areas. Yeah? When you do that, it's so much easier to kind of accept other people. If they may be different, you may not have exactly the same understanding, and, but you can accept them into your life, uh, and you can kind of uh, embrace humanity in a very different way. You know, this is one of the, I think, great things about being a Buddhist. We don't, we don't have to be anti-Islamic. We don't have to be anti-Muslims, right? There are lots of nice Muslims out there. And, okay, Islam has, you know, there are certain bad things obviously happening, but that doesn't mean that we judge individual people according to the background and culture. No. We accept individuals. We look at them, look at them, and if they are, you know, if they're going the wrong way, it's because of the conditioning of them. And then we have a sense of sympathy. If they're nice, we can understand them and embrace them as human beings. So, so actually it's quite nice to so take away all of this identification, all of this stuff. It makes us less uh, likable, like likely to divide and kind of you know make the world up into countries and, and genders and ages and, and intelligence degrees and education, all this kind of stuff. And we can accept people as people regardless of who they are. Even animals, right? Accept animals as well then. This is one of the beautiful consequences of this. And the more deeper you go into Samadhi, the less all of these things uh, 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 matter. Now. Right? Let's say that when you go into a real state of samadhi, when you go into a jhana state, even gender disappears completely. Yeah? At that point, there's no gender anymore. Yeah? This is what the Brahma, the Brahma beings are like when you go into jhana state. They are genderless beings. Yeah? So it stops at that particular point. Of course, these are very pure beings, right? Yeah? So the higher you are, yeah? the more developed you are, the less differences there is. Yeah? The more you can kind of come at an equal playing field. So it's all all very good and then so then you allow yourself by doing this allowing your uh, meditation to become more profound because you have less of these things that you have to defend think about being attached to etc etc so uh, then uh, the Buddha says that when this has been done then there remains only thoughts connected with the Dhamma now this is a translation where I maybe disagree just a little bit with Nikibodhi. Uh, I, uh, I think the correct translation in here should be that there remain only thoughts that accord with the Dhamma, that are in accordance with the Dhamma. In other words, the point here is that a thought which accords with the Dhamma is a thought with it, which is undefiled, right? There's no defilements in the thought. There are pure thoughts. Thoughts of loving kindness, thoughts of compassion, uh, thoughts of wisdom. Is that, is that what this really is about? Uh, so, you're, because you are purifying the mind here, so uh, and I think that makes a little bit of a difference. Thoughts connected with the Dhamma is more like th 
thinking about dependent arising, right, or something like that. Uh, but thoughts that accord with the Dhamma is that thinking the mind which is in the right state, the mind which is undefined. Uh, I did argue with Mika Vodhi about this because I, I like to argue sometimes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> But I didn't get anywhere, so he decided to keep giving this, which is fair enough. You know. he, he is the translator, so I can't really complain. Okay. Then, uh, so only these very last thoughts, and these are very easy to get rid of, right? If all you have is loving kindness, that's all you're thinking, it's very easy to overcome. But because there are these thoughts there, that it says that stillness is not peaceful and sublime. But not gained to full tranquility, and not attained to unification, but is reined in and checked by forcefully suppressing the defilements. Now that really is a bad translation in my opinion. I'm sorry to say, Mr. Venerable Bikivoli, I have to say, I should stress right away that Venerable Bikivoli, I consider him a great, great translator. He's one of the best ones around, and I have considered him my teacher for so many years in my monastic life. But there comes a point when the, when the student has to take his own stand, right? <laughs> that's life, right? Take your own stand. And sometimes we have to disagree with the teacher. I think that's, that's perfectly okay. So I did also argue with him on this one, but he, again, he, he didn't really budge on that one either. So what can, you, what can you say? But anyway, so it's not yet fully concentrated because even though you have all these beautiful thoughts in your mind, right? Loving kindness, compassion, all of that. Because the mind is still thinking, there is still movement in the mind. And that movement is the opposite of what is here, the full tranquilization. Not gained, he says, by full tranquilization, or not gained to full tranquilization, but either one would be, would be acceptable. So fully tranquil means completely unmoving. So hasn't yet gone there, it's not peaceful and sublime, hasn't yet reached the heights of samadhi, not attained to unification, right? This is one of the the standard ways of describing a mind in samadhi, uh, is, uh, especially in the jhanas, it is unified. It is not scattered. It is all, always kind of coming together in one point, right? One pointedness. Uh, the mind is unified. Uh, so not yet has yet come to that point. Uh, uh, but is reined in and checked by forcefully suppressing the defilements. Uh, now the uh, the word which uh, Venerable Bodhi has translated as forcefully here is actually Sankara or Sa Sankara. And Sankara uh, in the suttas, the main meaning of Sankara in the suttas is actually the will. Uh, it's the doing aspect of the mind again. Uh, it's similar to Chaitana uh, with the word we had a really quick look at at the very first sutta, uh, translated as volition there. Uh, uh, it is the same word uh, or the same, they are defined uh, in terms of each other. Uh, so it doesn't, I, I'm not sure why he, why he translated as forcefully here. What it really means is that the will is still active. The doing aspect of the mind is still active, right? So you are, it means that because the mind is moving, there's still some doing going on. And if you see that the defilement is about to arise, you turn your mind in a different direction to make sure the defilement doesn't arise. And so it is an active, and it is an activity of the mind that keeps the defilements in check. That is how I would translate it, translate this answer. So the mind is still actively keeping the defilements in check. Uh, that is uh, what I think is a, is a better way of looking at this. Uh, because at this point, the mind is becoming very peaceful, right? Uh, becoming very, very close to a full samadhi here. There's no defilements left in the mind. Uh, the idea of using force at this point is really uh, to me, is kind of outside of what really, really works at this particular point. Uh, but the active control, the active, uh, the active restraint of the uh, defilements is, I think, a good way of looking at this. Uh, the mind is still a little bit active, a little bit going on in there, uh, but already it's getting very beautiful. Uh, at this point, we're already uh, perhaps starting to see things like limitas, right? Uh, lots of happiness and joy in the mind. Everything is very peaceful. Uh, if you remember the previous uh, sutta we looked at, uh, so it's already getting very, very nice at this stage. Uh, but then comes the even nicer part, uh, which is next. Uh, but bhikkhus, bhikkhunis, uh, and uh, all the lay men and lay women, there comes a time when his mind becomes internally steady, composed, unified, and stilled. 
That stillness is peaceful and sublime, gained to full tranquility and attained unification. It is not, uh, it, it, it is not actively uh, checked, uh, the defilements are not actively checked and reined in. Then, there being a suitable basis, he is capable of realizing any state realizable by direct knowledge towards which he might incline his mind. Okay, I'm going to explain what that means in a second because uh, it may not be very obvious. Uh, so here, right, here we can have this idea that comes a time, right, that you don't know, what to, you don't know how long it's going to take. Uh, you're not uh, aiming for any particular goal, you're not aiming for any particular state. Uh, you know that if you practice in the right way, the results will eventually have to come. Because that is what happens when you practice in the right way. So all you're doing is you're sitting back, you're watching the breath, doing your meta, doing your meditation object. And as that meditation object develops, the defilements are gradually, gradually disappearing into the background. One of the things that is said about breath meditation, for example, is that it cuts off thought. Because there is still a little bit of thought left in the background here, yeah, the breath meditation is a great object to use to bring that unification of the mind. So you're watching the breath, and eventually uh, the mind matures in such a way that comes that time when uh, the mind is internally steady. Santitita is a Pali word, kind of uh, standing together. Uh, Sanvisidati, which means like sitting down together, right? It's kind of calming down, sitting down, and becoming unified. Uh, then unified is the next one. Ekodibhuta, Ekodibhava, or Ekodibhoti, I think it is here actually. It means becoming one, becoming unified. And the last one is Samadhati, which is stilled. Right? All of these things are words that are used in the Sutta to describe the mind that is entering into the jhana state. This is all about the jhana states you're seeing here now. Right? So this is where we're coming. There comes a time when finally and the mind is so peaceful, so delightful, and that you enter into these uttari uh, manusadama, these uh, states beyond the human realm, beyond humanity. Uh, this is literally what it means. Uh, uh, these are the jhanas all about. Uh, and that samadhi, that stillness, is peaceful and sublime. It is gained to full tranquilization, uh, to full tranquility, right? No movement anymore tend to unity, unification, and the mind is completely together, there's no, uh, there's no movement from one moment to the next one, and it is not, uh, it is not, uh, uh, there is no uh, use of the will here uh, to suppress and rein in and check the, the, the hindrances or the defilements. Uh, and this is like an important one, this very interesting one, last one, there's no use of the will, right? Uh, in other words, the point here is that when you enter, this is one of the few places where you find this idea, that when you enter a state of samadhi, of deep samadhi, especially the jhanas, there is no will anymore, there's no movement of the mind, you're not doing anything, the will is completely gone. And this is one of those things that makes this state so unusual and so different from anything else you've ever experienced before. We always use our will, right? We always say, I'm going to do this. You, you, you kind of control your mind a little bit. Everything we do has to do with willpower in one way or another. And this is the first time in your life when the will, all the doing inside is completely gone. <coughs> right? This is kind of very, this is why these states are so mystical and so different. Because you're experiencing something that you have never, ever experienced in your entire life before. The will, the doing, you can't even do. Even if you want to do, you can't. Because the mind is unified, right? And if the mind, uh, if, the, if you could do something and move your mind, it wouldn't be unified anymore. The very fact that it's unified means that there is no movement possible while you are in that state. You're just staying there, waiting, no will, right? And it's blissful. I mean, it sounds very scary, right? I can't do anything. Gee, that's really scary. What if I don't want to be there? What if I don't like it, right? Oh, really, really scary. Huh? But this is one of the things while I was saying in the meditation this morning. Uh, notice that when you feel peaceful, uh, when you are kind of present in the, in the present moment, right? You're just aware, uh, you're just staying with the present moment. Uh, notice how nice that is. Uh, you're not doing so much anymore. You're just passively aware of what is happening. Uh, and when you are aware, when you see 
and how nice it is just to be passive, and you're starting to understand why the will is a problem, and why actually getting rid of the, rid of the will is so nice. That makes you less afraid, right? When you see that this actually is a boon, is a benefit, it's wonderful when the will is disappearing, then you kind of, okay, well, let's go for the let's go for the full hog, let's, let's go for it, let's get, the, get those jhanas, right? And you become inspired by that. And this is so important because the teaching of the Buddha can sometimes be frightening to people. Have to let go of the will, gee, I'm not, I'm not ready for that. No self, right? Oh, what's going to, what about me? I'm, you know, I don't want to be here. But this is the other thing I would like you to also to look at. No self-teaching can seem very scary. Why? Because it's, you know, surely it's about me, right? I want to be happy if it's no self, you know. How does that work out? It sounds really scary. How to let go of the self? What does that mean? But it's actually very simple. And it's very, very easy to understand why it is good. All you have to do is watch in your meditation practice. When you become more peaceful, when there's less thinking going inside of you, there's less concern about yourself, right? Thinking about yourself. The less there is of all that stuff, the better you feel. Right? So the less self there is. Remember the self. It manifests through your thinking, thinking about yourself, who you are, your relationships, all of these things. The less thinking there is, the less self there is. And wow, it is so beautiful. Such a wonderful thing, right? And of course, then when you understand that it is a wonderful thing, it gives you confidence that actually, if I go to completely to no self, probably great, right? probably a wonderful thing. Yeah? Because a little bit is good, and going all the way probably is nice as well. So it is all about how it is so important to understand these teachings and perceive them in the right way. Think about them in the right way. Think, gee, I don't want to be a Buddhist. And what is it? Just too scary. Right? And think about them in the right way. And wow, actually, it's very inspiring and very beautiful. And you want to continue in the right way. Yeah. This is so, so important because um, uh, Buddhism is very profound. And if you kind of start off with the wrong teachings, it can put you off for life. But that's why you have to be very careful with these things. Yeah. Important to understand these things in the right way. So that is um, no, no will, right? This is what this says. No will when you uh, get into this deep, profound jhana states. All completely gone. This is one of the places where it says that. Too. Then there being a suitable basis, he is capable. Or, or that person is capable of realizing any state realizable by direct knowledge towards which they might incline their mind. So, this is, uh, this is quite interesting, or, or uh, um, at least for me anyway, but <laughs> I was recently, I was debating how this should be translated. I was debating with my friend Ajahn Sujato, who is now uh, translating all the uh, suttas, the whole four Nikayas, he's staying in Taiwan somewhere, just doing translation work, and a, a little, little bit online, but not much. And what this meaning is of there being a suitable basis. What does that mean? And the standard understanding of this means that um, it is when you have cultivated the path in the right way and you have the right kind of paramis and you have the right personality or whatever, when all of those things come together, that means that there is a suitable basis. And then, if the basis is suitable, then you can, you know, attain all the insights and all the psychic powers and all that kind of stuff. So that is what it means by any state realizable by direct knowledge, that means all of these amazing things, you know, the insights and the psychic powers or whatever you can realize. That's what that means. So. But um, it, it is a bit strange that it says there being a suitable basis because this whole sutta is about creating that suitable basis, right? So why does it say now there being a suitable basis? And I think that uh, after, uh, I think that meaning probably is that uh, it's not so much about what you have done or the kind of qualifications you have, but rather wherever there is something to be realized, that's actually what it means, wherever there is anything to be realized, then you are capable to realize that. So there are, you know, there are, in other words, there are, it is a limited amount of things in the world that can be realized, but those things that can be realized, you are able now to realize them. So wherever there is a foundation, wherever there is something, anything which the mind can understand, you have the potential to understand that at this point. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll leave that. <laughs> if you don't understand what I mean, then that's fine. But uh, uh, it doesn't really matter so much. The point is, now your mind is ready, right? The mind is unified. You 
have got the, you have got the profound samadhi, just go for it, enjoy yourself. Uh, most importantly of all is to, is to realize, of course, the profound insights. Uh, but uh, if you are inclined, so you can, according to the sutras, you can do all kind of weird stuff at this point. Uh, like, uh, you know, walking on water and sinking into the earth and walking through mountains. That would be cool, we to walk through a mountain. You can just walk into the mountain. <laughs> and, uh, disappear into the rock, right? Uh, Oh, you really? We're just sinking into the earth. <laughs> so that's some kind of science fiction movie. But this is this is what the sutras say, basically, that is possible at this point too. Uh, one of the things, of course, that the, uh, the Buddha said, which is also very interesting, yeah? and this is from the uh, Kavada Sutta in the Diga Nikaya, he says there, which is fascinating, that he and he doesn't like these psychic powers. He abhors he abhors them. He uh, he, uh, he, he talks about them in actually very strong negative terms. This is in the Diganikai 11, Kivana Sutta. And, um, uh, and then uh, this, this person asks him, well, why? why is that the case? Why is it that you are so negative about these psychic powers? And the Buddha says, well, uh, if somebody you know, performs any of these psychic powers, like flying through the air, or reading minds, or whatever, uh, the person who is skeptic, the person who is a believer, they will be fine, they have no problem with that, they will say, okay, yeah, wow, that's really cool, isn't it, great. But the person who is skeptical will say, ah, oh, it's only a magic trick, right? It's only they're using some kind of strategy and creating a magic trick. So this is not the right way of actually con convincing people about the Buddhist teachings. Because these are, anyway, they're not really the essence of what Buddhism is all about. And people who don't believe will not be impressed by that kind of thing. And there was a, I don't know if you, I don't know if anyone here saw it, but there was a few years ago, there was a, an English magician, uh, his name was Dynamo, and he, uh, he, one day, he was, he was standing, you know, the River Thames in, in, in London, right? Uh, he was standing on the shore, or he was standing on a, maybe a little jetty or something, kind of jutting out into the River Thames, uh, and then there was the Waterloo Bridge, I think, there's a big bridge going up the river, just, just next to it, uh, and all these people were standing up there watching this man, right? Uh, and then he would put one, and there's a very low jetty, very close to the surface of the water. And then he would start walking off the jetty, down onto the water, right? And then he would walk onto the surface of the water, and he would walk out on the water. And people would look at <laughs> people would look at this fellow, right? What, he's actually walking on water. Maybe it's Jesus Christ coming back or something. It's the second, the second coming, right? So what's going on here? And then, of course, he was a magician, so of course he wasn't walking on the water. It's only an illusion. The people were really staring at him. You can see that people are absolutely shocked when they see this man walking out on the water. And later on, of course, he, he divulged how he did that. How is it that you walk on water? It's very easy. All you have to do is you put a, some kind of transparent uh, uh, glass or something on, on, which floats on the water. It's actually like a piece of plastic or whatever, very strong. And, and it goes out into the water and you walk on that. No problem, you can walk on the water. Right? This is what magic is all about. This was kind of a classic example of how you can how you can do things which normally uh, kind of baffles people. Then, so for that reason, I I don't really recommend too much concern about these psychic powers. It tends to be too much uh, too much concern about that in the Buddhist world. That it's not something that I would uh, I would encourage people to to believe too much in. Very often you hear stories about these things, uh, and in my experience, those stories are very very unreliable. People tend to see what they want to see, hear what they want to hear, right? So it is very, very unreliable. When you see it for yourself, okay, then maybe you can believe. But still, be careful, right? It might be dynamo walking out on the river tents. <laughs> so you better be careful. <laughs> okay, anyway, so here we are. So that is what happens, right? So it's actually wonderful. You get this extraordinarily powerful mind, and you can do whatever you like with it. And uh, so that is basically what this is about. And of course, the main thing is to gain those insights, uh, the vidyas, the recollection of the past lives, and the destruction of all defilements is what really comes at this stage. Uh, okay, so that is the gradual removement of the defilements. Uh, the things towards the end here are very profound, but I think everybody can uh, understand what is, uh, you know, can use this kind of teaching because it gives you an idea of where you're at and how you have to proceed on the Buddhist path. Uh, is there any questions about this before we move on to the next sutta? Yes, sir. How does the Buddha define mind as different from consciousness and the function of brain? It's always 
Okay. Yeah. Well, then, these are just words. Right? So it, it, you have to be very careful here. The Pali, the Pali word at this moment translated as consciousness is vinyana. Vinyana is one of the five khandas, right? The five personality groups. Mind is usually a translation for the word chitta. Chitta is, is usually mind. So, so, the problem with these things is that some, because they are just words, they are sometimes used in one way, sometimes in a different way. Sometimes these are used as synonyms, meaning the same thing. Yeah. The Buddha, for example, he says that this thing which I call mind, which I call consciousness, which I call mentality, <coughs> right, uh, this thing which I call mind, which I call consciousness, which I call mentality, in that case, he's using them as synonyms, <coughs> meaning the same thing. Right, uh, at other times, they are used slightly differently. At other times, uh, uh, vinyana, <coughs> consciousness, is one of the five khandas, it is specifically about your ability to know, to be aware that it, is, it actually refers to. So you can kind of div divide, in, in theory, this is not, not in reality, but in theory, you can divide the mind up into different aspects. You can see there is a knowing aspect of the mind, right? There is a feeling aspect of the mind, and there is the perception aspect of the mind, and which recognizes things. And so in theory, it can be divided. In reality, it all merged together. It cannot really be divided up. But we can't just have knowing without something, knowing something. It has to be all part of the same thing. Uh, whereas mind is often used instead as the usually means everything in the mental world. Everything coming together, feelings, perceptions, the willpower, and everything you can experience in the mind uh, is, is, uh, is mind, uh, is chitta. So this is the um, this is the this is the difference now. Um, so it's all about how we use words, really. And as for the brain, the, the the best way to understand the brain, I would say, is to understand that the brain uh, is really uh, like a restriction on the mind, right? Uh, so what it means, in a sense, is that uh, when you uh, the mind it, uh, is like filtered through the brain, right? So if you have let's say that you get some brain damage. Uh, Right? It looks like you, your mind is damaged as well. That's because the mind is filtered through that brain. And so when you get brain damage, it will seem as if the mind also is damaged. You can't really talk to the person anymore. It seem like they have lost their intelligence or their ability to speak or whatever. Alzheimer's, same kind of thing, right? The brain gets damaged. So it looks like the whole personality is damaged. But uh, it's it very fascinating, isn't it? Uh, uh, and this especially with Alzheimer patients. It's a very uh, interesting book that I read a few years ago. Uh, which is called, uh, what's it called again, the irreducible mind. And the irreducible mind has a lot of evidence about the mind not being equivalent to the brain, which is kind of the orthodox position in modern science, that the brain, brain mind, the same thing. But this collects in very, over 700 pages by top scholars, evidence that supports the opposite idea. And one of the pieces of evidence in there, which is very fascinating, is the idea of Alzheimer patients, people who are, you know, getting very close to death, uh, uh, having had severe Alzheimer's for years and years, can't recognize anybody completely out of it. Uh, uh, but it's a well-known phenomenon, apparently, in hospitals around the world, that some of these patients, at the very end of their life, uh, uh, they come out of that and they can start to recognize people again. They say, oh, hi, hi, mom, hi, dad, uh, um, or, you know, hi, son, or whatever it is. Uh, uh, how are you, right? And let's ha have a conversation. And this conversation, maybe 10 minutes, and then and they go, and then they die. Yeah. Now, from a perspective of modern science or medical science, it's completely unexplainable. You can't explain it because the brain has Alzheimer's and it hasn't suddenly changed to become healthy again. And from a Buddhist point of view, it is very easy to understand because towards the very end of your life, your mind is starting to dissociate from the physical reality of the body, and, right? And because it's dissociating from the physical reality of the body, it is no longer filtered, it is no longer hindered by that brain which is damaged. Is dissociating and from that uh, and becoming free from that, uh, and that's why you're able again to, to actually to speak to people and to, to recognize them. So the mind is not hurt, the mind is, is, is not damaged, it's the brain that is damaged. Uh, so there is a that I think is one of the perhaps easiest ways to understand the brain mind thing. The brain is like a filter for the mind, uh, and that's why damage to the brain will affect your personality. But once you die, the mind will be just what it was before again. This is why we don't, in Buddhism, we don't have to worry too much about many of these problems that people have, right? Like Alzheimer's, not such, okay, it is suffering for a number of years, but then when you, are, when you die, you're free from it again. Right? It's not so bad. 
if, you, if this is the only life you have, well, that's, that's tough, that's pretty, pretty harsh, but at least you're free afterwards. Or many of the you know, very severe psychological illnesses like schizophrenia or even depression, sometimes it's caused by imbalances in the brain. Once the brain goes, you're free from that and you can be okay again afterwards. So it's not, so, it's not as bad, right? There's a different way of looking at things. There's something behind that which is still healthy and, and okay. Are you happy with that answer? Yeah. Yeah. Can your explanation be much the same as perhaps the physicist explanation? Which was the explanation? Or generally the, the physicist. Ah, physicist. Okay. 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 Good. Brain, yeah. brain, uh, the mind is beyond the brain. Yeah. 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 Where you explain that the mind filters the brain. Yeah. The brain filters the mind. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. Good. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, samadhi and samadhi, all the four jhanas are included in samadhi. Yeah. But at the very least, it means the first jhana, and uh, possibly the fourth. Yeah. Okay. Everybody else happy? Yeah. Good. Okay, so let's go on to the next sutta. And uh, this is. Uh, uh, Ajimani Kaya number 19, and two kinds of thoughts, the Veda Mitaka Sutta in Pali. And a uh, very nice sutta in my opinion. This is the Buddha talking about his practice before he uh, before his awakening. And this is to me has always been one of those interesting things that the Buddha talks about his own practice before his awakening. And why does the Buddha do that? What is the purpose of talking about what he was doing? And I think the obvious the reason why he does that is because he wants to inspire us, he wants to explain us that this is what I did, you should practice in the same way, right? You should do exactly what I did. And so uh, he's basically trying to inspire us by giving us, saying, this is the path I practiced. It. But it is important in the, uh, in, very important in the situation to remember that the Buddha was a human being just like the rest of us. So if the Buddha was not just like the rest of us, if the Buddha was some kind of uh, you know, God or some kind of special, the, the, you know, the, the uh, what's it called, the, uh, uh, you know, has, you know, whatever, if, if he is different from us, if he's not the same as we are, then of course his experience and his practice is not really applicable to us in the same way. It's only really applicable to us if the Buddha is human just like we are. If he had the same defilements, the same problems, uh, the same kind of things that he was searching for as we have, uh, and he, he was the same person, then his practice becomes applicable to us. Uh, it's very important to think about the Buddha in the right way. Uh, yes, the Buddha was special. He was special in the sense that he was able to find the path, uh, right? To find this plan in the teacher. That, of course, is already pretty awe-inspiring. We are trying to practice the path, right? Uh, we have got all the teachings. Uh, Still, it is so hard sometimes, and he did it by himself. Wow, that's pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah. 
So that already kind of puts the Buddha in a special position. But don't be careful not to elevate the Buddha too highly. If you elevate the Buddha too highly, then it becomes very difficult to relate to the Buddha's practice and to understand the Buddha in the terms of actually being a human being, pretty much just like us. And you find this, in what, and I will show this as we go through the Sutta, because the Sutta makes it fairly clear that the, uh, that, that, that is actually what is happening here. So keep this in mind, and then the sutta here becomes much more meaningful and powerful when you keep that in mind. So here we have uh, starting the sutta from the very beginning. Thus have I heard it. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jaitas Grove, another Pindika's park. There he addressed the bhikkhus, the bhikkhunis, the laymen and the laywomen. Uh, thus. Uh, Bhikkhus, bhikkhunis, <laughs> uh, etc. Venerable Sir, they replied, the Blessed One said this. Bhikkhus, before my awakening, while I was still only an unawakened bodhisattva, it occurred to me. Suppose that I divide my thoughts into two classes. Then I said on one side thoughts of sensual desire, thoughts of ill will, and thoughts of harming or thoughts of cruelty. And I said on the other side, thoughts of renunciation, thoughts of non-ill will, and thoughts of uh, non-cruel, non-compassion, uh, if you like, on, uh, on non-ruthlessness, which sounds a bit strange, but anyway, non-ruthlessness. So, so uh, here we have the Buddha living at Savati. How many people have here been to Savati? Many people have you been to Savati? Yeah, quite a few. Okay, great. Yeah, I've been there a few times myself. Some of these quite nice. Um, it's quite quite nice that it's possible to go to this place at the present time. This was, of course, the place where the Buddha stayed the most, uh, and where he would get most of his teachings. Uh. And then he says very interestingly here, because before my awakening, uh, while I was still only an unawakened bodhisattva, right? Uh, so what does that mean? Bodhisattvas? I thought, I thought there wasn't any Bodhisattvas in Theravada Buddhism. What's going on here? Where is this a kind of Mahayana uh, intruding on the Theravada? What, what is happening here? And uh, the answer is uh, uh, no, it's not Mahayana intruding at all. Uh, this is the Buddha talking about his, uh, his prior to his awakening. He wasn't the Buddha yet, right? Uh, and what he called himself before his awakening, he called himself by this word, Bodhisattva. That was actually what he used to talk about himself. And in the suttas, the, uh, the time that the Buddha was the Bodhisattva, uh, most prominently, is after his leaving the home life, until he became awakened, right? While he was searching for awakening, yeah, that was the time he was a Bodhisattva. So it doesn't really go back into past lives. It doesn't go back for incalculable and 100,000 eons or whatever it is. It doesn't do that. In the suttas, basically, it goes from the time uh, that he went forward and decided to be a monastic. Yeah. Now, there are certain suttas which also use the word Bodhisattva uh, prior to that. And one of those is the Acharya Buddha Sutta, which is Majjhima 123. Uh, and this is about all the wonderful and marvelous qualities of the Buddha. And this is one of the few suttas where it says that the Buddha, uh, or not the Buddha, the he, he was a bodhisattva even prior to that, and even yeah, while he was dwelling in a previous life in the Tusita heaven, uh, he was already a bodhisattva according to that sutta. But that sutta uh, is, uh, is rather unique, it's rather special, it has a lot of elements that are late, uh, and you can see that again by comparative study with the Agamas that I talked about before, and many late elements. Uh, so personally, I don't take the, the information of that sutta as as important as, as the later information, which basically is that he a bit, was a bodhisattva from the time that he left uh, the whole life. So what does bodhisattva mean? Normally, bodhisattva, uh, bodhisattva is the Sanskrit term, bodhisattva is the, is the Pali term. What does it mean? Usually it's translated, usually it means like enlightenment being. Sattva or sattva usually means being, and bodhi means awakening or enlightenment, right? So while I was the un unawakened, the awakening being, yeah. it's a bit strange, right? It's a bit, it's a bit strange. What do, you, what do you think about it? It doesn't really, doesn't really come across as very natural. Then. 
And I think that the meaning of this word, and this was something that was uh, suggested by Professor Richard Combridge a long time ago, is that this word actually doesn't mean that at all. It comes from a different Sanskrit root, which is not sattva, but sakta. And sakta means somebody who is intent on something, right? And so what it, what it means then, and uh, well, what I think it is quite likely to be, it's impossible to say with certainty these things, uh, but what I think it is likely to mean is uh, that while I was still uh, an unawakened, well, I was still unawakened and intent on awakening. Right? Uh, that is what I would take uh, this word to, to mean. Uh, and uh, uh, then I think could, the meaning comes out much more nicely than this rather strange term, the uh, term of awakening being, which to me doesn't really make all that much sense. Uh, so, this is the first thing about the Sutta, which is interesting. Uh, the one who is intent on awakening. Uh, and that, of course, only happens after you go forward from homeless, from the home life into homelessness. That, that's when the Buddha himself was intent on awakening. Uh. So, uh, then it occurred to me, right? And, it, and the first thing, I divide my thoughts into two classes. Uh. So he, what he's doing here, he's understanding that there are certain thoughts that should be grouped together. Thoughts of sensual desire, ill will, and uh, cruelty, as it or, or um, harmfulness, or ruthlessness. Uh, and on the other side, the pure thoughts, which are thoughts of renunciation, thoughts of non-ill will, this includes metta, and thoughts of non-ruthlessness, which includes compassion. Uh, so, the, so this is already... Um, uh, an interesting point in its own right, this ability, and this shows you that the Buddha already had developed uh, a lot of understanding, uh, because he was able to understand very clearly the distinction between wholesome and unwholesome. Uh, this is what this, this is all about, right? Uh, the unwholesome thoughts on the one side, and the wholesome thoughts on the other side. Uh, and this is not as easy as you may think it is, uh, because uh, these thoughts, uh, as we saw in the previous suit, the defilements can be very refined, right? Uh, but unto very refined things. Uh, the desires that we have can often be about very subtle and minor things in life. Uh, the uh, ill will can be also sometimes very, very subtle. Uh, if you haven't got full meta, it may mean that there's a little bit of ill will there, which is kind of stopping you from having the experience of meta. It's not really ill will that is active, uh, it's more kind of this passive thing inside of you, which is blocking you from feeling uh, compassion and meta to other beings. Uh, this is very refined things. Uh, uh, and this shows that one of the things that we need to do on the Buddhist path uh, is precisely to understand the distinction between the wholesome and the unwholesome. Uh, and as you move along the path, uh, that distinction will start to change. Uh, right? When you start to develop your mind, uh, you start to put away some of your bad habits, some of your, you know, uh, whatever those habits may be, and you put those away, other bad habits will surface underneath, right? Uh, more refined bad, bad habits, and then you have to look again and you have to say, oh, okay, well these habits are coming now, and then you have to, uh, again, divide them in and understand which ones are wholesome and which ones are unwholesome. And sometimes it is quite difficult to see these things. Uh, it's quite hard to actually take this all the way, because some of our attachments and things are so subtle and so refined and they're so attractive to us, uh, they can be very difficult to give up. Uh, so it takes a lot of clarity to understand these things fully. Uh, and this is why uh, on the Buddhist path, you find a lot of the Buddhist path is about contemplating uh, your defilements, contemplating your mind and understanding the differences. And this is what Satipatthana practice is about, when it comes to the Dhamma Nupassana, uh, the uh, understanding of Dhamma. So if you read that, as I was saying just before, uh, a lot of that is about understanding the five hindrances. What, number one, what they are, because they are so refined, it is not obvious what they are. Well, sometimes it's very obvious, right? If you get really angry, you know exactly what's going on. But if it is very refined, it is not so obvious. So first of all, knowing what they are, knowing why they arise, knowing how that arising comes to an end, and knowing how they don't arise again in the future. So this is why this contemplation is so important, and why it is a fundamental part of Satipatthana practice. In fact, when you look at the overall idea of Satipatthana, what it is really about, you will see it is all about the juxtaposition. On the one hand, the impure mind states. On the other hand, the pure mind states. You have the chitta vipassana, contemplation of the mind. It is all... If you don't understand what I'm saying, please, please just... You can, 
don't you raise your hand and let me know because maybe sometimes I use Pali terms or whatever you know, without really thinking about it properly. Yeah. Um, but on the one hand, you have the Chitta Vipassana, you have all the negative states of mind. Uh, mind states which have, have desire, which have anger, or what, whatever. You know. And on the other hand, you have all the pure mind states. Uh, the same thing with Vedana Vipassana, the contemplation of feeling, exactly the same thing. Yeah. And the first uh, Satipatthana, which is about the Kaya Vipassana, contemplation of the body, you know, that too is about overcoming attachment and desire in regard to the body. So really, Satipatthana practice, one of the main purposes of Satipatthana is to help you to understand the distinction between defilements and non-defilements, and how to overcome the defilements. So. And then you go to the Bojangas, and you see, look at the Bojangas. Bojangas are the awakening factors, right? And same thing again. First of all, you have the Satisan Bojanga, which is the awakening factor of mindfulness, so, which relates. I've just been telling you mindfulness is all about overcoming defilements, right? And this is similar. And then you have the uh, Dhammavichaya Sambhodanga. Dhammavichaya Sambhodanga is investigation of Dhamma, so, right? Very similar to the Dhamma Nupasana of the Satipatthana Sutta. Investigation of Dhammas is explained as understanding dark and bright states of mind. Dark is defilement, bright is not defilement. Uh, understanding minds that are, have, are blameworthy and non blameworthy. Right? And again, about defiled states and undefiled states. So, so much of the Dhamma, so much of this is precisely about understanding defilements and non defilements. Uh, because this is the only way you can overcome them by understanding what they are. This is why this is emphasized so much. And this is why this is a very important teaching right here of the Buddha, this classification of the mind states into two different categories. So it may seem kind of obvious when you read it, okay, you classify one this way, but actually, this is actually quite profound already here. And that is why in the next, very next sentence, oh, am I going to the part again? This is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, there is, there is a weird little thing, Bobby, in the in your uh, your agenda or your table here because it says that this super session three is from two to two fifty, but the break only begins at three. So between two fifty and three, it's like an empty, it's like a void, sunyata between the two. So I, I can do whatever I want, right? I can I can take those ten minutes and use them to my heart's desire. Anyway, I'm just going to stay. Be very very short. And that is why it is interesting that the Buddha then says, next thing he says is, as I abide in thus, diligent, ardent, and resolute. That's the next thing he says, right? So, this is interesting because, well, first of all, let's get the translation a bit better here. Diligent is apamada, right? Apamada in, uh, really means more like being heedful. That's what it actually means. Heedful means being careful, right? Being circumspect. Knowing, okay, is this bad, is this good, moving in the right direction. That's really what it means. Diligent to me is more like you know working very hard and sitting at your desk working long hours into the night or whatever. That's kind of, kind of diligent too. So it means being heedful, careful, circumspect. Ardent, atapi, is really a synonym with being energetic. This means that you have energy. And resolute is closely connected to the four right efforts, so having effort. So the person who has effort, who is energetic, and who is heedful, right? And that is what it means to be heedful. That is what it means to be energetic. It is just that, the dividing of your thoughts into two different classes, right? Isn't that fascinating? Because what it mean, does not mean is using your willpower, kind of like gritting your teeth. You know, I'm going to be kind, right? Or I'm going to force my mind into the right person so I can be kind. That is not what it is about. It's, a, it's an aspect of wisdom to be heedful here, because it is wisdom that it enables you to divide your thinking mind or your mind into two aspects. So it is not your willpower, it's your wisdom power. No? So it, it is wisdom here that is described as being heedful, being energetic, and being uh, having effort. That is an aspect of wisdom. So again, just the point I was making before, that wisdom has a very powerful part of the Buddhist practice. And much more so than you might think by just reading these things. But once you start to understand the implications, you start that that is indeed the case. Okay, so now we have, I definitely haven't got any more time now. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop at this point. So, so we'll see you back in 20 minutes. So please just stretch your legs or whatever, and then we'll continue afterwards.